Welcome. Today we're going to talk about the resurrection. And uh, there have been a lot of ideas from different people and places and culture about what comes after death. What is after life? And uh, from all the different ideas that have been produced, we need to find something that's valid. What is it that we can believe in? Um, we can look at these ideological beds or environments and say, what have they produced? Is there, uh, is there a test of credibility? Is there a test of probability? Are some of them more likely to be true than others? And... Um, what ideas have obviously come from strikeout cultures that just don't make it at all? Hinduism and its reform called Buddhism has reincarnation. Uh, people keep dying and turning into stuff and coming back around and around, but the population is growing. I don't know where people would be coming from unless bugs and snails are turning into people or whatever. Um, that's kind of a wash. And besides, there has been no significant contribution from that culture to anything that we enjoy today. Um, there are no contributions there. Islam is another one. It's basically a sixth century religious totalitarianism uh, built around a dead false prophet. And there are no contributions there. They claim there are, but they say, oh, we gave algebra to the world. No, algebra came from Arabs. Not all Arabs are Muslim. Okay, uh, then there's uh, spiritism, jungle people, tribal people, non-literate people. Um, there's no contributions there. We look at the cults, the JWs, the Mormons, the Adventists, the Baha'i, Unitarian, uh, Sikh, Wiccan. No contributions. There's no, uh, uh, there, there's no MRIs or uh, vaccinations, vaccines, or there's nothing. The car's not being invented there. Nothing's coming out. Uh, virtually all of the profitable inventions have come from the Judeo-Christian culture. And uh, this is a testimony of God. God-given rights, uh, gender equality, civilized morality, rule of law, individualism, free market, intellectual honesty, respect, respect of life. Um, these all come from the Judeo-Christian culture. You're not going to find them anywhere else. Okay, in a very distorted sense, you might say, oh, yeah, but they, no, but they really don't, okay? In a contributory fashion, they've never contributed an iota to where the world is today. Okay, um, let me talk about life after death in that, well, first of all, life after birth, okay? You and I have some, some, and I emphasize some control of life after birth, okay? Uh, you can get a good education, you can work hard, you can get a degree, you can know the right people, high, you know, have influences and, and know people in right places, high places, and there, there, there are things that you can do to a limited degree. You can't control your gender, even though some say you can, you cannot. It's the Y chromosome, number 23. And uh, there are other people that say, um, uh, well, well, no, you can't control your race. You can't control the nation that you're born into. Um, a lot of things are beyond your control. Some things you do control, some things you cannot. Okay, however, I want to contrast that with life after death. You have no control. Zip, zero, nada, nothing. You can't control any of what happens after you die because that falls into the realm of reality. That is God's dominion. It's not, oh, well, I think when I die, my heaven is going to be uh, 72 virgins. You know, that's not for you to decide. My heaven is going to be a sailboat. That's not for you to decide. It belongs to reality, and reality belongs to God. And God is the one that controls and dominates what happens to us after we are dead, okay? So God has spoken in Scripture about the resurrection of the dead, okay? Because Paul said, if our life, if our hope is in this life only, we are of all men most miserable. Speaking of his life as an apostle, the sufferings that he had to go through, the scourgings, the, you know, yada, yada. It wasn't a very good day for him. As a matter of fact, he lost his head in Rome, but that head now has a crown on it that Jesus put there because he went on to glory. 
Okay, but the prophets foretold Isaiah, for instance, 25, 8, speaks that he will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away all tears from off their faces. This is a reference to the life after death. Okay, there is more than just what we have here. Book of Job. Job said, oh, that my words were now written, that they were printed in a book, that they were graven with an iron pen on a, on a lead rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I, she, shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold him and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Sounds like the resurrection to me. Job knows that Jesus is coming, but he also knows that there's a resurrection coming, okay? Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, uh, the 15th chapter, he says, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Okay, we know from Scripture, from the history of the Bible, uh, and Paul also wrote it in Romans that for since death came through a man, well, re resurrection of the dead also has to come through a man. Uh, just as in Adam all die in Christ, shall all be made alive, okay? And uh, this was the plan of God from the very beginning, the resurrection. Now, let me tell you that Christ did not resurrect himself, Okay, God the Father raised him from the dead. We are Trinitarian, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Um, in Acts 3.15, it says, Whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses, Peter says. Acts 13.30, but God raised him from the dead. In the sixth chapter of Romans, uh, Paul says, As Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. And he wrote to the Galatian letter, which Onesimus carried so gratefully there. Uh, he addressed or introduced the letter, Paul an apostle not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Okay, so this is not this is not like, oh really, I thought he raised him from the dead. No, very clear, okay? Colossians 2.12, ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Even Peter, who was somewhat outside the loop or considered to be a rebellious kind and you know what not, uh, he said by him, speaking of Jesus, um, in whom we do believe in God that raised him up from the dead. So it, it was God, God the Father raised the Son up from the dead. Uh, yes, Jesus laid his life down. This commandment have I received of my Father. I have power to lay it down and take it up because it was within the parameters of God's will to raise him from the dead. Now the resurrection of Christ was a very real thing, a very vital thing. As a matter of fact, if the resurrection didn't happen, then you and I are wasting our times. There's no such thing as Christianity, okay? But a lot of people, even his disciples at the time, didn't understand um, what, what the resurrection was, okay? In Mark 9, 9 and 10, it says that they came down from the mountain and he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen. They saw the glorification. He had gotten a, his vesture had turned um, whiter than any fuller on earth could make him. The voice spoke, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Elijah and Moses were there speaking of the law and the prophets who were testifying to the Messiah. They saw this in the, in the mount. But um, uh, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen until the Son of Man were risen from the dead. Okay, and the verse after that says, uh, and they kept that saying to themselves, questioning one with another what the rising of the dead should mean. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. They absolutely didn't get it. Now, they had seen resurrections. Lazarus was, uh, or excuse me, resuscitations. Lazarus was raised from the dead, but he died again. The widow uh, of Nain, her son, died, and uh, but he had to die again. Even in the Old Testament, there was a man who was thrown on top of Elijah's bones. His body was, and he sprang back to life. Uh, but that man, whoever he was, that soldier, he, he died again. Uh, those were resuscitations, not a resurrection is eternal, okay? It's uh, you don't come back to the same old body, you know, that Lazarus you know, had. Um, his grave clothes had to be unwrapped. Jesus's grave clothes did not have to be unwrapped, okay? Um, in the 20th chapter of John, you've got this uh, 
thing, the two apostles running to the tomb, John and Peter, and John stops and Peter runs in and he's stopping down. It says, uh, he looked in John and he saw the linen clothes lying, yet he went not in. And then come a Simon Peter following him. And Peter went right into the sepulcher and seeing the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head, speaking of Jesus's head, he had, had been buried there. Um, and the napkin uh, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Okay, then went in also that other disciple. Here comes John, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. Well, what did he see? What was it that convinced him? You think it was grave clothes that had been unwrapped and raveled, and there was a 50-foot strand of... Uh, of grave clothes like kids that uh, toilet paper a house or something like that? No. I believe the grave clothes were flat. I believe they were totally wrapped together. They were just empty. I mean, this is, this is much greater than Harry Houdini, okay? Jesus got out of that. I mean, that was quite a feat. That was an impossible feat, quite honestly. You can't unwrap yourself from graves clothes, but you can go right through it. You can come out in the resurrection. You can leave you. For some reason, whatever John saw there, he believed. It made a believer out of him. It says, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So they only knew resuscitation. But when they saw the grave clothes simply collapsed and flat, oh my gosh, this is entirely permanent. This is completely an eternal condition. Jesus, though, his, his resurrection, although he left the grave clothes, um, it was not ethereal. It was not, it was not you know, something that... Uh, it was not imaginary. It was not a fantasy. He appeared to Mary Magdalene. He appeared to all the women at, at the tomb. He appeared to Peter. Um, he appeared to two men on the road to Emmaus. He um, appeared to all the disciples when they were gathered for fear, shut inside of a room there. And then uh, Thomas wasn't there. So eight days later, he appeared uh, to them again. And, um, and then he appeared to over 500 brethren at once, it says. And then he appeared to James. And this is James speaking of the brother of Jesus, um, who quite honestly was not a believer. I think in Matthew about 15 or 30, 13, 55 or somewhere in there, you'll see that he was gathered outside with his brothers and sisters. And um, they thought Jesus, they didn't believe in him. They're, that's it. They didn't believe in Jesus. Okay. But James did become, he wrote the book of James. He did become a a believer after the resurrection. This was a physical body, okay? Jesus actually ate. In Luke 24, as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them saying, peace be unto you. And they were terrified. They were affrighted. They supposed that they had seen a spirit, the scripture says. And he said unto them, why are you troubled? And why do thoughts um, arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Handle me and see for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed unto them his hands and his feet. And while they believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, children, have ye any meat? And he gave, and they, and they gave to him a piece of broiled fish and a piece of honeycomb. And he took it. And the scripture says, and did eat before them. So this was not a, a phantasma. This was not a ghost. This was, this was a real fish and honeycomb consuming Jesus that was in front of them. As a matter of fact, uh, they grabbed him. They grabbed a hold in Matthew 28, 9. It says, as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, all hail. And they came and they held him by the feet and worshiped him. Okay, so this was a real physical appearing. Um, uh, Jesus did appear. He could appear in the midst of them when the doors were shut. As we just mentioned there, that means that although the body is physical, it has different capabilities than it did before. He didn't knock on the outside, okay? And uh, uh, he came in, he stood in the midst, and he said, peace be unto you. So he appeared to them. He appeared, um, it says, on the uh, road to Emmaus, the two that were walking with them. As they walked, they went in, into the country. This was speaking of the road to Emmaus. So Jesus could appear out of nowhere. Um, he could also dis 
appear, okay? In Luke 24, 31, it said, and their eyes were open and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. So what he's saying is, get ready to know me. When Mary grabbed him by the feet, he said, do not touch me. I am not yet ascended. What he, what the real parsing of, of that verb is, do not continue holding on to me. In other words, the physical um, even though we've known Christ after the flesh, Paul said, henceforth know we him no more after the flesh. Christ is revealed to us by the Holy Spirit, okay? So we need to get used to him not being physically, well, let's say physically visible, okay? Because when Thomas, Thomas said, uh, the disciples said they saw Jesus and Thomas said, I don't believe it. I'm not going to believe unless I put my hands in his scar and the wound in his side. And Jesus was not visible then. This was Thomas saying, I don't believe it. I don't see him. And then eight days later, J Jesus appeared and he quoted Thomas. He said, okay, Thomas, put hither thy hand in my scars. Behold my scars, touch my side. And um, it, it doesn't say Thomas touched him, but it does say uh, that Thomas cried, my Lord, my God. He recognized who Jesus was. And Jesus just basically, he just appeared there. That was a, uh, a witness that he gave, okay? Now, Jesus didn't appear to everybody. Um, James, I can't speak for, uh, but um, Jesus seems like other than James, there's no record that he appeared to unbelievers, okay? And I say James, I don't know where James was at that time spiritually about his decision for Christ. But uh, he didn't appear to Caiaphas. He didn't appear to Pilate. Um, it appears as though he came to believers, okay? Well, these uh, believers were witnessing. They were writing Gospels. Luke, for as much as many, has taken uh, in, in hand to set forth a declaration of those things which are most assuredly believed among us, even as they were delivered unto us, um, which were from the beginning. We were eyewitnesses and ministers of, of the word. He said, it seemed good to me also, having had a perfect understanding of all things uh, to write unto you, most excellent Theophilus, okay, that thou might, mightest know the certainty of those things wherein um, thou hast been instructed. So Luke is saying, I'm an eyewitness. I'm writing to you not by hearsay, Theophilus. I'm writing something. I was there. I touched him. I saw him. I know him. This is, uh, you know, this is the real deal. And of course, what we just said in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said that he was seen above 500 and uh, he was seen of James. He said um, that the greater part remain unto this day. That was when he wrote that, the letter to the Corinthians. Uh, but some are falling asleep and that's Christian talk for dying. Um, and af after that, he was seen of James also. But I want you to know that the resurrected physical body of Christ is immortal. Paul wrote to Timothy in 6.16 about Jesus who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. Uh, no man can see him nor um, can see to whom be honor and glory and power everlasting. Amen. Okay. And speaking about seeing Christ, there are certain riches that are unsearchable. If God doesn't show them to you, you'll never figure them out intellectually. Christianity is, uh, is a revelation. Jesus is... Uh, revealed to us by the Holy Spirit of God. Well, I want us to know that also we have a resurrection also. And Job, who we spoke of earlier, he said, and though after my uh, skin worms destroy this flesh yet, or this body, yet in my flesh, shall I see God? So Job, the oldest book in the Bible, is talking about the resurrection my resurrection, okay? Psalm 17, 15 says, as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness, okay? Likeness in Hebrew is image or form. It is speaking of the resurrected Messiah. David is saying, I have the resurrection in my future, okay? Paul says in Romans in the sixth chapter that we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, so shall we also be in the likeness of his resurrection, okay? I know we share a lot of things in common with Christ and sufferings and, and love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith, yada, yada, but his resurrection, okay? Philippians 3.21, who shall change our vile body, that's this, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he, Jesus, is able to subdue all things unto himself. And John makes it very clear, beloved, us, now are we the sons of God? 
It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, when Jesus shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Okay. So there is a resurrection of the dead for you and for me. I'm sorry that it's sown in corruption, but it's raised in incorruption. Okay. It is sown in dishonor. Uh, it's raised in glory. It is sown in weakness we will be raised in power. It is sown a natural body. Um, It's going to be raised an eternal, a spiritual body. And I don't mean a ghost kind of spiritual body. There's a natural body. There's a spiritual body. Um, And so it is written, the first Adam, he was made a living soul. And the last Adam, not the second Adam, but the last Adam, there is no second. Uh, There's a last, that's Jesus, okay? There won't be a third, fourth, or fifth. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it, uh, that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, okay? We don't take the image of Christ first. We take the image of Adam first. I'm sorry. And afterwards, then that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth. He's earthy. And the second is the Lord from heaven. He's heavenly, okay? And as is the earthy, such are they also that are of the earth. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly, Okay, we've borne the image of the earthy, and we're going to bear the image of the heavenly. This is just the way it's going to be. I wish we could hurry it up or speed the process, um, but Paul made it very clear where he said, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. All right, corruption does not inherit incorruption. And then he said, look, it's a mystery, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I show you this mystery. We shall not all sleep or be dead but we're going to be changed, okay, you and me, just like Jesus. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, uh, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. This in, this, uh, this um, corruptible uh, has to put on incorruption and this mortal is going to put on immortality. We're going to be clothed upon, okay? So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and the mortal has put on um, immortality, then will be brought to pass that saying, death is swallowed up in victory, okay? So the last trump hasn't sounded yet. People are still dying in the faith. They're not receiving a glorified body, but there is going to be a resurrection where we will have a Christ-like body. I want you to recognize also that personalities are going to remain. And I'm not talking about the sinful personality, the things our hearts are full of, adultery, fornication, murder, theft, covetousness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. Jesus said all these things come from within and defile the man. But in the resurrection, we're not going to be corrupt. We're going to be incorrupt. We're not going to, it's going to be completely different. Our personalities are going to be shaped and altered. Christ's personality is exactly the same, okay? And I want to close with basically saying this. Um, There is a reason that I believe his personality is the same. And if I had to think, what is it that happened in the life of Jesus that commemorates, okay, his personality, his volitional acts, uh, the things that he chose to do that he didn't have to do, I would say that there is nothing more um, obvious in the life of Christ about who he is, his mission and passion, than his scars. Jesus still in his resurrected body, carries his scars, okay? The scars, number one, they're proof. He said, behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Okay, handle me, see me, a spirit hath not flesh and blood, okay? It is I myself. The scars let us know that the same heart that said, I'm going to endure the cross, despising the shame for the joy that is set before me, that same heart, that same person is still the same. And the scars in his hands and the wound in his side are a, a commemoration, a sign. Uh, um, I don't know, you know, in wartime, they have an award called a purple heart that if someone is, you know, maimed or wounded for his country or, or if someone does a heroic act, then he gets a purple heart. Well, the scars that Jesus has, he got from the most heroic act you could ever imagine, okay? Those scars were given to him because of his desire 
to save you and me. He didn't have to... He, he didn't have to take the scars on earth, and quite honestly, he didn't have to carry his scars to heaven in a resurrected body, okay? Um, his visage, his face, Isaiah 52, 14 says that it was marred more than that of any man in his form or his body, uh, more than the sons of men. When they were finished beating Jesus, it was incredible the... the how he was deformed, okay? The swelling, the ripping of his flesh, his body, he was like no other man. He was bearing our sins, don't forget that, okay? Uh, but he didn't, but yet he didn't take the the scar torn, the flesh torn face and back with him to heaven or in the resurrection, but the scars he kept, okay? Battle scars are honorable. Let me repeat, battle scars are honorable. His scars are honorable. They are a memorial of the battle that he fought for our souls. To us, they're beautiful. They're a glorious sign of unconditional and everlasting love. They're wonderful. He died. Revelation 1.18, I'm he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. He got those scars. He paid for those scars. The scars also mean that he's a high priest for us, okay, which can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He was in all points tempted like as we are. Jesus has the scars which mean you're worth something to me. I love you. I desire you, okay? His, his, his wounds are, are, are so beautiful, and he carried them into the resurrection. And when he showed them to Thomas, that's why he said, my Lord and my God, they mean something. They're incredibly valuable. These wounds are not running wounds. They're not putrid wounds. They are beautiful wounds, okay? As a matter of fact, you can, you can reach the heart of Jesus. The wound in his side broke his pericardium, goes all the way to his heart. They are reminders. They are reminders of what he's done. His wounds also, since we know he has wounds, they can be reminders for us too, okay? In uh, Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.12, it says, If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. There was a man by the name of Cromwell in Fox's Book of Martyrs. I forget his first name, not Oliver of the Praise God Parliament in England, but he was just a Christian man who was being burned alive for his faith in Christ. And the uh, bishop of the Catholic Church spoke to him and mocked him while he was lighting the fire and said, now, how is your faith? Now, what do you think of, of your faith? And he answered and he said, is the servant above his master? And uh, if you're a Bible reader, you know <laughs> that the servant is not above his master. And the next verse there in Fox's Book of Martyrs says, and he went to God with a good countenance. Um, we can have scars in our life, that's fine. What an honor to identify with Christ, to fill up you know, that part of Christ. Now, to the unbelievers, the scars are a horrible sign. They're a sign of rejection. They have rejected Christ. The scars mean uh, that they nailed him, they crucified him. They were the culprits. They were the ones, okay? Zechariah 12, verse 10, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one that mourns for his only son, and he shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Okay, this is an indictment. This is uh, an infraction. This is like, wow, his scars. I put them there. I was responsible. I rejected the Son of God. There is a time, and we'll discuss the return of Christ at at a later time. We're in his resurrection right now. and uh, But... Um, the scars are an indictment for those. The Jews are going to look upon him in uh, whom they have pier pierced. They're going to see him. Mary saw him at the tomb, and she um, assumed him to be the gardener. And she turned herself and, and uh, uh, said, Where have you taken him? Let me know where his body is. And Jesus spoke to her. All right, and she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which means master. She recognized him as, even though she didn't understand his physical character at that particular time, uh, she understood his personality. 
that he loved her. He called her by name. And when he called her by name, her soul just opened up. She got it, okay? She understood who he was. When he was uh, on the road to Emmaus, they recognized who Jesus was when he vanished out of their sight. Uh, it said they knew him. They knew him. Obviously, they say, how did he know him? Um, he was given the bread to break. And if you ask me, it's conjecture, but when he raised his hands to break the bread, the scars were obvious. And they saw the scars on his hand and they knew him. They knew him and he vanished out of their sight. Okay, and this is a wonderful sign that the personality, Jesus, is exactly the same. As a matter of fact, one last thing, we have a record over in John in the 21st chapter. Jesus was on the shore cooking. The disciples were out fishing and uh, they realized uh, he told them to come and dine. He said, come on in and eat. And Peter had jumped overboard and swam to, uh, swam to shore. And there was kind of um, I guess kind of an excitement, maybe kind of a guilt, maybe, I don't know what kind of emotional storm was going through their heads at the time, but that verse says, it says, none of the disciples dared ask him, who art thou, knowing, <laughs> knowing that it was the Lord. Mm -hmm.